Good morning. How are you? Just gone. 11 o'clock this Friday morning, a uh, somewhat dull and overcast day across Dumfries and Gallery. Uh, not what we were expecting at the start of the week. I'm Lee Med from Dumfries and Gallery Chamber of Commerce. Uh, glad to hear and see so many of you here uh, for our latest webinar, which is something that's very important to all of us just now, health and safety. And as we move into this new normal, as we keep calling it, uh, we're going to look this morning at the steps we can take to get health and safety ready in the new normal. I don't know anything about health and safety. I'm not even gonna pretend I do. So I'm delighted to say we are joined this morning by one of the most trusted names in health and safety across the United Kingdom. He is the uh, Managing Director of the Boyd Group. It's Raymond Boyd. Good morning, Raymond. Good morning, Lee, how are you? I'm great, I'm great, my friend. Looking forward to uh, taking lots of notes this morning because it is a hot, hot topic, health and safety. We have got questions galore already come in about the subject of health and safety this morning. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, answer some of those and, and give some advice on the practical steps we can be taking as we get ready for this thing that we are calling the new normal. Uh, but before we do start, Raymond, if you could, uh, could you just give, for those of you that don't know Raymond, uh, a brief overview of your, your background in health and safety? Now, I've been doing health and safety for over 40 years now. Um, in fact, we in Boyd Group are celebrating our 25 years come November. Uh, we've been in business since 1995. Um, vast um, knowledge of health and safety from corner shops to massive big uh, in industrial units. Um, the COVID stuff is actually really quite interesting for me because I got involved quite early. Um, we've got a contract down in PD, um for a very large power company um, that's, that's constructing a, a new power station. And they like everything 100%. So we were involved very heavily with COVID-19 right from the start. Um, but more or less, as it, as it occurred, we were putting um, systems in place. Um, so I've got a bit of knowledge on, about COVID-19. However, because it's a new virus, nobody, really could profess to know everything about COVID-19. But um, let's hope today or this morning we can actually put some nice easy steps for people or, or make it understandable for people how to get back to work safely. And I think that's the thing, Raymond, as you said, there's, there's so much still evolving. There's, there's information coming at us all the time and it can be quite overwhelming. Uh, I'm just going to run through some of the topics that have come in this morning. Uh, and I know we'll get through some of them throughout the course of your presentation, some of them after. Uh, so we've had people asking about documents and records we need to keep, uh, COVID-19 risk assessments, social distancing, communal areas in, in shared building spaces, uh, temperature checks for staff and customers, a whole host of things. So I know we will hopefully cover some of those this morning. If you do have any questions uh, throughout the course of the event, it's really easy to get in touch. If you just move to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the question and answer box. Click on there, type your question in there, and we will uh, get the answer we, we can for you before the end of the morning. That easy to get in touch. So at this point, uh, Raymond, I would like to say, please help us get ready for health and safety in the new normal. Right, well, I've prepared a, a very short um, PowerPoint presentation, which I'm now about to share. So um, bear with us, everybody, because I am not the best at these um, at technology. Uh, and I have been tutored by a very good person, i.e. Lee. So I'm about to try and share my screen with you for COVID-19. Five-step action plan to get your workplace COVID-19 safe. So um, we're about to share that. And we should be there. Is that right, Lee? That is grand. I think you just need to uh, double click your display to make it full screen. I've got full screen. Ah, here. Uh, well, I'm, I'm on full screen on mine. That's so okay. Well, well, there we go. If we, if we start like that, and then we can just talk our way through the slides and we'll send a copy of these out to, to yes, the end. absolutely. Anybody who wants a copy can have a copy, no problem. Right, legal documents. That was one of the questions, in fact. Legal documents required. You need an infection control policy. Um, it doesn't have to be made by a company like us. Um, 
there's a lot of profiteers out there, so be very careful. Um, you can make your own infection control policy, but please, please understand what you're writing and don't just copy somebody's off the internet. You, the second document, which is really more important than anything, is you do need, and this is a legal requirement as well as the infection control policy, you need a COVID-19 risk assessment for your workplace. And you, you, again, it's not too difficult. There's lots of things on the internet you can look up. Um, and if you've never done a, a risk assessment before, basically go to the start of your office or your building at the door, open the door and walk through it and look at the places within that building which you think there is a risk of somebody being too close to, i.e. less than two metres, uh, is, there, is, there, is there a chance of transmission? Um, and you, you start understanding, but before you even get to the building on your risk assessment, consider how does my staff actually get to work? Do they actually come by public transport? And we've got to try and discourage that at the moment, public transport wherever possible. And of course, the governments, both Scottish and English governments, are basically suggesting stay at home if you can work from home, because that's really the first thing. But back to the legal side, as infection control policy required a COVID-19 risk assessment for your workplace. And the, the, the main question is, do you have five or more employees? Don't forget, folks, that this is actually health and safety legislation we're talking about. And like any other risk assessment or policy, if you employ less than five employees, you don't legally have to have this written down, which is a strange thing to say. However, that's what HSC and the government starts to come up with. But how do you prove that you've done it if you don't write, uh, if you don't, um, write it down? So the five points um, that I've come up with yet for is work from home if you can. That's the most important thing and that's what the government's saying. If it's possible, stay at home. However, we do need to get um, industry back up and running and all the workplaces safe for people to come back to. And I've got a vast number of clients, uh, all different types of clients, and there is no two workplaces the same. Um, so you've got to start looking at, it, it's, there's not one answer for everybody, let's put it that way, but I will try to give you these answers later on. Carry out the COVID-19 risk assessment, as I've said, right from the start. How does my staff get there? Are they coming individually in cars? Have I got enough parking spaces for all the, the, the additional cars coming? Are they coming, are they cycling to work? Where are they going to keep their bikes? All these things are important and you have to look at that. Then we have to look at uh, the third point is maintain a two metre social distancing wherever possible. And if, if it's not possible, you have to manage the transmission risk. That's the legal requirement. It is a legal requirement for you to maintain two meter social distancing and, and avoid or manage the transmission risk. Then we have to reinforce, point four was reinforce cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures. And honestly and truly folks, apart from the legal part, of course, the actual Point three and four there are the two things that the government is pushing and will actually save our lives by ensuring the good hand washing, the good hygiene procedures, the good cleaning, and keeping this two meter social distancing. And the last one, um, it might not seem important to you, but um, fire processes and procedures. Depends on the size uh, of your, your company, um, you will have perhaps fire wardens in larger companies. And you've got to consider the people who are in furlough at the moment. Are they my fire wardens? Are they coming back? Have a, you know, can, I, can I operate? Because legally, you shouldn't be operating without fire wardens in place or people who have been trained in to fight fires. We've had two major fires recently in Dumfries. Now, I'm not suggesting you be able to fight these fires anyway, but nevertheless, you, we've had two major fires and we're legally bound to have fire wardens in place. So if we look at home working, is it possible and is it a benefit to the company? And lots and lots of people, lots of my clients I've been speaking to are basically saying, you know, this working from home is really good for us. It frees up office space, the people are happy, we keep in contact with them. Um, there are legal requirements to this as well, which we'll get to um, as we go through this. 
Um, if it's not full time, can part time home and part time work be considered? You know, can we work part time at home and reduce? I mean, another of my clients, a very large client uh, in the in Dumfries. They've got people coming in just Mondays and Wednesdays and then working at home Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. Um, and it's, some, some are doing that and some are doing the opposite um, days. So they're reducing the number of people in the premises and again, a good way of social distancing. Um, if you are working from home, have you got a home working policy? Because we need one. The minute we do something, HSE say, oh, you need a home working policy. So, you'll get that off the internet quite easily. It, it, it's no difficult thing to produce. And the other thing you've got to consider is people are taking uh, information home from work. Does our data protection policy need to be reviewed? We've got the GDPR regulations, so obviously we've got to look at are we, are we allowing something that's, that's confidential uh, out of our office environment? And how do we keep in contact with these home workers? We have to have regular contact with the, with the home workers. Now, there's a thing there that says, now, what about DSE assessments? That's display screen equipment assessments. Don't forget that if we have somebody working at home for us, we have to ensure that they've got proper, proper facilities. They can't be sitting on the couch with a laptop on their knee. That is not part of the DSE requirements. We have to have a DSE assessment, albeit, we don't have to go to their house and assess it. You would ask them to you give them the form and they would assess their workstation. So they have to have a proper workstation in place. And we have to give them advice and file and electrical safety, obviously. Um, we've got no control over their home, obviously, but we have to give them the advice and we have to record that to ensure that we've given them all the information to work at home. So a home worker is just the same as having an office worker. Now then, the biggie. Carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment. Are you confident to carry out a robust risk assessment yourself? If not, then you have to employ somebody like us. Um, and this is not a sales pitch by any means, because um, this is, this is a, a pandemic. People are having to pay through the nose of these profiteers, and it's not a good thing. You don't, if you can do it yourself, great. Um, I, I've offered free advice over the phone, and as long as I don't have to go out to see anybody, there's no cost to that at all. I'm quite happy, to, and I've been talking to churches and all sorts lately, and um, giving them advice on social distancing. Um, so you must be confident to carry out a robust risk assessment. That's a requirement of law. Will it help you decide if you need to use PP and RPE? When you walk through your workplace, you will then be able to say, oh, wait a minute, we need PP for this, or we, we need gloves because they're, they're leaving the office and they're going into somebody else's home or they're delivering parcels or they're, they're um, driving a vehicle. So that risk assessment should decide for you. I need PPE and RPE. You don't always need it. An RPE and PPE is a last resort, remember. It's way down the line in the hierarchy of controls. Can you confidently select the right PP and RP for your staff? The big issue is getting it. It's very difficult. And we are, a, we are a, an actual reseller. We sell all that kind of stuff. Um, and we are having to pick out from our suppliers. And we're having to outsource it from other places now. Uh, our main suppliers are telling us nothing till September. Um, and that's why the profiteers are, are, are scoring because they're charging ridiculous prices for a box of um, rubber gloves, you know, disposable gloves. But you have to be able to select the right thing. And don't get bogged down by face masks. Face masks, these surgical type face masks, they're all different. The surgical type face mask that you will see doctors wearing or dentists wearing, they're tested um, to protect the patient so it, it's coming out the way. It doesn't protect you. And the good thing about you, the England at the moment have decided that everybody must wear a face mask. And that makes sense to me because the, these face masks are tested out the way, not in the way. So if everybody's wearing it, it means that everybody's going to be protected. Um, and anybody that needs a bit more information about face masks, they, they can ask me. Um, there are some rubbish going around. You'd be as well putting your hand over your mouth. Um, so be very, very careful when you're buying, um, buying these kind of things. Is the risk assessment easily understandable to all employees? Why is it asking that question? Because the legal requirement for risk assessment is you have to 
um, share the risk assessment with your employees and they have to sign it to say they fully understand it and will, uh, will um, comply with the requirements, the control measures in it. You must communicate under the communication regulations. You must communicate with your staff on everything you're doing. When you change your workplace and change desk positions or working formats or met methodologies, you've got to let the staff know that. At some point, we, we need to look at the office. I know everybody's in furlough, but your office, uh, the chamber, we need to look at that to because they're all face-to-face -face desks. We are not allowed to do that. It doesn't work that way without screens and things. So we need to look at that. And because we're having to change workstations, we have to tell the staff for doing that and discuss it with them. How will you train your employees in its content? That's very simple. That's very much a toolbox talk, a very short training session on basically, and we're talking two or three minutes. This is what we need to do, folks. This is why we're doing it. Please ensure we're, we're, we, we carry out these control measures. Does the risk assessment consider how your staff get to work? Well, going back to what I said at the, the right at the start, don't forget before they get to work, how are they getting to work? Are they, are they, are they meeting other people in, in public transport? Um, are they in a minibus, a company minibus? Or have we got it set up so that we're socially distant within the minibus, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to think about how are they actually getting to work? Um, and that's a biggie because if, if we don't consider that, they could be bringing the, the actual virus um, which is around. And as you've seen on television lots of times, there are carriers that have got absolutely no symptoms. You don't know who we're sitting beside. And what about vulnerable people in the risk assessment? We've got to consider vulnerable. There's, there's what's known as clinically ex, ex, extremely vulnerable and there are um, uh, clinically vulnerable people. And we've got to look at that. Um, and we've got to basically the extremely vulnerable state home. Simple as that. Um, Rick, can you, I just ask a quick question here? Yeah, That's yeah, all right. You mentioned yeah. obviously when you're doing your, your risk assessment, you've got to make sure part of that, that your team understand why you're doing it and the changes that you're looking to make. Yeah. Would it be possible, would it be acceptable at this point uh, if you were, as, an, as a line manager, you go in, you, you do that assessment, you make the relevant changes in the office, and then as part of your training session, you could, before the team come back into the office, actually take them through it in a, in a Zoom-type webinar like this. Very much so, Lee, and, I, and you would do that electronically. You don't need to bring them in to do it. You would actually, um, you would first of all, when you're doing your risk assessment, you would do a, a rough draft if, a draft, if you like, and basically get the staff on board and say, this is what, um, we've found this is what we need to do to get back to work, to make our workplace COVID-19 safe. Um, what do you think? Um, and, you know, two heads are better than one. And, and a risk assessment, it's always good to have two or three people who know the workplace to actually do the risk assessments. But yes, Zoom is amazing. And um, basically, that you could do that quite easily. If somebody doesn't have a computer at home, then you, you could post it out to them and basically have a, you know, have a conversation that way. A telephone um, call that, that way, you know. I mean, just everybody in their aunt has got a telephone nowadays, or two or three for that matter. Um, so basically what you want to be, there's no real excuse for not to discuss it with, with your staff. But yeah, good idea. And that's exactly the way you would do it. You okay with that? Yeah, that's great. Cheers. Maintain two metre social distance, and this is probably, um, in some cases, exceedingly difficult. In other cases, it's not. And it very much depends on your workplace. And it very much depends on the size of the place as well. Um, I, now, I've been talking to hairdressers, which are not back to work yet. Um, we've been talking to uh, laundries. We've been looking at uh, big offices. We've been looking at all sorts of places. So, um, and a restaurant, um, one restaurant at the moment um, has got some, we went over that, how we're going to do it, and it's all possible. So, do you need to remodel your workplace? That's the first thing. And looking at your office, Lee, I know everybody else has not been in, in the chamber office, but looking at your office, the answer is yes. We have to remodel it, um, or we have to put screens in. But basically, we have to remodel it completely and have a rethink because. The face-to-face -face, um, desk positions now is, uh, is not acceptable without screens. 
um, and you know these the plastic cans they're called spit guards feed. Um, so basically, we have to look at that. Do you need to make one that we walk through now? And some and this this is not always the case. And it, it, and it, you know small premises may only have one way in and one way out, which is absolutely acceptable. However, I, I was at um, a, a factory yesterday. Let's put it as a factory. And um, the the manager, the general manager of the factory, great idea. We're coming in one door, and she's actually changed the the actual entrance to a fire exit. So she's coming in the fire exit. All the staff will come in the fire exit, painting arrows on the floor because it's a concrete floor, and making it a one way system. And basically, perfect. Uh, with some lines in, basically, just as you would see, and uh, when you're doing Tesco's or Little or wherever you're going. Um, some lines in the floor to keep the two metre distancing. So basically, um, one way in and a one way system, one way back out again, it works. If you can do that, some buildings just don't have that facility, so we have to consider um, other things. Um, places like the college in Dumfries, I've looked at that one, um, and the, the places at, the, for example, the college, believe it or not, the corridors are not wide enough to give us the two metre uh, separation. So we're going to have to do a one-way system in there. And in some of the wider corridors, we're splitting the corridor down the middle so is that you only walk one way on that corridor and back the other way. And people will get used to it very quickly because let's no kid ourselves, folks. This social distancing is going to be around for some time. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Now, they might reduce it from two metres to one metre, but it's still going to be around. Um, and we're just going to have to get used to these things. Um, so can you have a door in and a door out to avoid bottlenecks? Um, and that depends on numbers. You might only have yourself and one other. No bottlenecks required there, or it's no bit happen. But the larger operations could have bottlenecks with people coming in. You've got these splits known as pinch points. Uh, can you change desk lay layouts to ensure no face-to-face -face desk positions? If you can, you have to do it. If you can't, then you have to put um, screens in. Simple as that. Can you stagger start and finish times? So if you've got a large number of people, or even a smaller number of people, can we have so many people starting at 9 o'clock or half past day and so many people starting at 9 or 9.30 to reduce these bottlenecks? Um, if it is such a thing to do, you don't always have to do that. And as I said, Every workplace is different. It, there is not one, there's no one answer. There's no one size fits all in this case. If your staff can't stay two meters apart, can you put in barriers or split screens? That's the question. You have to, you, you have to manage the risk. And that is a way of controlling the risk. Can you create fixed teams to manage risk, uh, risk of transmission? Fixed teams are smaller units of staff. So if you've got a couple of people that normally work together, that's a fixed team. And um, one of the places I looked at yesterday was they're, they're actually doing that. They're having their engineering guys working as a small fixed team together. Um, so you're, you're reducing the, the chance of transmission by having these new fixed teams working together. And the last one on that, do you have signage and floor tape in place to ensure social distancing? You need it. And if you look at that slide, if you can see the slide, they've actually got these are their um, taped off workplaces. Uh, and you actually need to, you cannot just assume that your staff will remember the two metre distance in. You cannot just assume that, oh, well, that distance is two metres. You physically got to mark out wherever you can, or if you need to, um, Spaces for them, they have the two metre distance, and that's what you have to do. I was talking to a hairdresser yesterday, and she's like, crack, she's actually putting a screen in because um, she needs to actually keep, she can't get two metres away, so she's putting a, a, a full screen in uh, between her, her two dressing out units, um, which is good. But the other problem she has got is that um, it's touching, you know, I mean, you, you can't you cut somebody's hair without touching them. And you can't even wear gloves because you'd rip the gloves to pieces. I mean, these scissors are razor sharp. Another biggie, reinforcing cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures. Now, additional cleaning materials around the workplace and kitchen and toilets should include disinfectant sprays known to kill coronavirus and, and uh, uh, antibacterial wipes. What kills coronavirus? Leech-based. Kills it within about 30 seconds. 
And basically, uh, what we've got in the office here, and we've got a relatively small office, I've I got some um, thin bleach and I've diluted it in accordance with what's suggested to kill off this uh, virus, um, five tablespoonfuls basically into a wee spray and we spray everything. So it smells like a bleach house, but, but you know, it, it smells clean at least. And the, the, the standard antibacterial wipes um, should be around the, the place and these kind of things. Then you go spraying bleach onto photocopiers and stuff like that, for God's sake, that's electrical. So um, the last thing you want to do is, is put liquids near the electrical items. So you need your antibacterial wipes. And we've got a pack of wipes sitting beside the photocopier. So anytime anybody uses a photocopier, they literally um, wipe over the, the buttons. Um, so we know that it's actually clean before you touch it. Um, encourage staff to clean equipment. The staff should be clean. You know, this is part of their requirements of law. They have to comply with health and safety. They're responsible under health and safety law for themselves and any other person. You as an employer are responsible for your staff and your clients and your customers the minute they step through that door. So you, you have to deal with this, unfortunately. Um, keyboards and things like that. Um, and I would be encouraging, you won't see my desk at the moment because of COVID-19, but I would be encouraging um, for sure a clean desk policy. The desks are emptied every night so is that you can Get them a wee, um, a wee clean down every night, um, and that that is really important because if there is any virus around, it's going to lie for three to five days on flat surfaces, depending on the material. Bins provided preferably near exits for PP and RP disposal. Where you are using PP and stuff like that, um, the, you have to provide bins. And if you cleaners, for example, if they're actually taken off their disposable gloves or disposable apron. They should be bagged uh, in a bag and kept in that bag for up to 72 hours to allow the virus to, to, to die off, basically, um, before that sealed bag gets placed in the, norm, in the normal um, bin outside. So anything that you think could be contaminated, with any chance of contamination, kept in a bag near the, the, the exit, um, or outside for that matter, um, but um, for 72 hours before disposing of it in the, the outside bin. Because don't forget, the bin men come along and, and you know, we're, we're to protect everybody else, not just ourselves. Communal equipment, cups, crockery, etc., taken out of use. So all this, all this stuff in the office that's communal, um, if you've got your own cup, great, you can keep it. But you're responsible for it, you're responsible for cleaning it, but crockery and things like that in, in the kitchens, taken out of use, you're in, in disposable. The, the factory I was looking at yesterday has coffee machines and kettles and microwaves in place. We're taking the microwaves out and we're taking the, we're leaving the kettles here, but we've taken all the cups away and we're basically insisting everybody uses the, I'm going to say the coffee machine, it's a, one of these things you put a coin in. Um, and that solves the problem. Um, but no communal equipment. We don't know if it's contaminated. That's, that's the issue. So we have to take all that kind of stuff out of, out of use. And of course, you look at hairdressers, first thing you get when you get into a hairdresser is, would you like a coffee? You're not going to get that. You're not going to get your magazines in, the, in the, the, the dental surgery or anything like that, or you shouldn't, because they could be contaminated. Somebody else has picked them up. Social distance can continue at break times. Remember, if you've got a large number of people, you're going to be staggered breaks. You've got to have to ensure that um, the actual tables are set up um, so that you are, they are, you have got to physically, don't rely on staff. You have to physically set up the table and chairs in a canteen, for example, um, that they're two, two metres distance apart. You've got to be able to show that. Okay. Um, consider Legionella. What in the earth is that about? We've been in furlough for some time. We've not been in the premises for some time. So all that water is sitting stagnant. Have we been going in? Has somebody been going in and, and flushing the system out? The big client in the face of mine has been doing that. Um, they're a big landlord. They have lots of office space um, available and they have been absolutely hot on that and they've been flushing their systems out very, very frequently. So you have to consider these kind of things. Um, has, has the water been sitting in pipes? or in tanks, uh, no, no, and we've had a lot of hot weather, remember, as well. 
And of course, we've got to think about cleaners. Now, cleaners can be professional cleaners, as in we employ cleaners to come in. Um, so they need the correct PPE. Um, but you might be cleaning your staff toilet out, or, or if you've got a, you know, a, an office that, that you don't have a physical cleaner and you take turns of cleaning the toilet, you need full PP for that. And your full PP, because you can have um, airborne aerosols, um, and we don't know how this COVID moves around, one of the, the things that's been suggested is that it could be in urine and it could be um, in feces. So uh, disposable gloves, this is for cleaning toilets, disposable gloves, disposable apron, face shield, possibly mask, um, these things are necessary for cleaning the toilet down where other people have been using it. Okay. Last one, I hope I'm not boring anybody, but this is where we're going. Last one is, is, is pretty straightforward to be honest with you, but it's very, very necessary because when you think about it, small premises, no such a big issue, but is fire risk assessment up to date? Because we're changing work methods, we may have to review our fire risk assessment. Every premises, if you haven't got one, um, you should have one because uh, um, no workplace should, should be operating without a fire risk assessment. Um, basically, uh, if we're changing methods of work, um, processes or whatever, we may have to look, you might have to be even changing routes to fire exits. Um, so we have to look at fire risk assessment updates. And, and on the subject of fire uh, escapes, are they still available? Are they still viable as well? Can we actually use them? Because don't forget, in the event of a fire, this social distancing goes out, out, the, out the, the window because you get out the building. And the health and safety part of the UK's um, legislation, basically, uh, or the health and safety stuff, that fully, you must fully comply with that. So the manual handling element, for example, where you have two people lifting, uh, say, a table in a restaurant, then you can't socially distance because it, the, the table's no two metres long. Um, so you still have to comply with the manual handling regulations, but you still have to ensure you're managing the transmission risk. So then if you've got two people together lifting a table, then you have to think about, right, what do I need to give them to do that? That could be a face shield, that could be a mask, it could be all sorts of things. And as I said, everything's different. Are your fire wardens coming back? As I said, you might have um, a larger organisation where you've got fire wardens, depending on the number of staff you've got, depending on what you'll have. Um, make sure you are covered that way. And if not, you have to train them. Um, very quickly train other staff to become fire wardens. The premises I was actually in yesterday was, um, it's not back to work yet, but I've suggested we actually have COVID-19 wardens. Now, no training requirement apart from a toolbox talk. And the reason I've suggested that is people will um, not necessarily stick to social distancing, as you can see around you when you're traveling the, the, you know, the streets. People do know, especially um, younger people for some reason, they're, they're immune to this virus or they think they are. The, the fact of the matter is that you have to be able to control that. And as, a, as an owner or an employer, you have to ensure that you have lots of pairs of eyes in your workplace. And that's down to, um, depends on the number. The, the fact I'm talking about will be employing a good number of people when they all come back. So they have suggested to have COVID-19 wardens to actually, like four, four men or charge hand people that can actually manage it and ensure that people are sticking to the rules and regulations. The, the, and the last one there is, is your fire, fire alarm, fire extinguishers, emergency light and the fire doors up to scratch. They've not been used for a wee while. Are they still in order? This is a pre-check before you have people coming back to work. Um, one of the interesting things, or, or, or it sounds, maybe it didn't sound that interesting, but believe it or not, is toilets. Wherever you are, the issue of social distancing in a toilet is exceedingly difficult. And so far, no matter where they've been, it's one person in the toilet at a time. Now, on some of the premises, you might have a toilet door in a corridor. It's a communal toilet, so when you open the door, there's a lock on it, and it's just you in there anyway. But then you have the other type of toilets where you open the door, then you've got a second door, and you go in, and the wash hand basins are there, and there's maybe five cubicles or urinals or whatever. Um, 
we have to be able to socially distance it, even in toilets, unfortunately, and communal kitchens. So that is the end of the um, representation. Um, and then, Lee, I think we could go for questions, if you like. Yeah, thank you very much for reading me. There's lots of notes I've made throughout the course of that and we've had some questions come in already. If you want to get your question in right now, you know exactly how to do that. It's using that question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. And it's funny you mentioned uh, toilets there towards the end, Raymond, because that's uh, one of the questions that has come in uh, right away. It says, how often do you actually need to clean the toilets, the deep clean of the toilets, would that actually be the responsibility of the person that has just used the facility before the next person comes in? And how would we know that that has, has been done if you're in a, a restaurant or perhaps even a communal building? That's a good question. Um, it's extremely difficult to actually know anything that's happening um, before you get there. But you take our toilet here, for example. It, it, it's a single, we've got a single gents toilet, a single ladies toilet, and what we've what I've put a simple sign on the wall that you um, you actually wipe the seat, for example, with an antibacterial wipe, which is provided there before you use it. Simple as that. Now, it's difficult. Is it difficult? In communal areas, um, if you've got a landlord, and it really depends on your contract, the deep cleaning of it should happen before the staff come back. That's the first thing. So that the place should be deep cleaned before anything happens, okay? any, any restarts. Um, and that should be, I can be deep cleaned by yourself if it's just an office, you know, like we've deep cleaned the room for you. Um, as I said, the place is smelling like bleak. Um, so we do a deep clean on a weekly basis, basically now. Uh, we've been open for a couple of weeks now with limited staff, um, but we've been open for a couple of weeks. So we've got all these other things that now, as far as um, other cleaning, not deep cleaning, but we clean door handles, we clean light switches, we clean any surface that has actually been touched or possibly touched by anybody at least three times a day in a normal seven hour day, at least three times. Now the big thing is, and a lot of people have said to me, could we get prosecuted? Or do you think somebody could sue us if they actually, um, got the virus and that they, they thought it, they got it from work. Well, the answer is that that would be reportable to HSE because it's, it's an infection. So it would be reportable. Um, it's proven where they got it is the issue. So you need to know how your staff's getting to work. You know, is that a possibility? And you need to record and you need to have meticulous records now. And it's just simple, you know, just written down records. We have a, a cleaning regime and we actually, in my office, and I said it's not a big office, and we actually initial whoever's actually wiped the door handles or whatever. And, it, and if that's three or four times a day, we have the date, we have the time, and who did it. And we have all these records of when, um, when things were done. For example, because we are a trainer, uh, a training provider, we have deep cleaned all our um, first aid uh, equipment and preparation, changed all the ones and all the rest of it um, for the, the, um, the mannequins, training mannequins. So everything's been deep cleaned and that's recorded. We do breathing apparatus as well. So we, we train in confined spaces. So everything gets deep cleaned prior to the course and after the course, um, as well as during the course. So we keep records of that and we can prove that we've done that well when i say prove it's only as good as the person actually writing the record and they've actually done it so you are relying on people but you've basically got um this in place and you have to have these records in place just on that uh, should there be as questions come in a uh, separate staff and customer toilets where we're available we're available, yes, but no, it's not always possible. You, you'll take a hairdresser if it's going to be a shared toilet. Um, there's no issue about that at all because they're coming into your premises anyway. You're responsible for the customer. Uh, and you would try and discourage customers using the toilet if at all possible. But it's, that's not always going to be possible. Um, and, and if so, you just need to make sure that it's clean. You take a hairdresser again as an example. The, you have a customer come in, they have a coat. Where does the coat go? 
You know, that's something that's got to be considered. Is there another customer there? Can you be signed another customer's quote? You can't handle that quote like you used to, help them off with a quote. You can't do that. Where do you put it? So you've got to make some provision for where that quote goes. Now, that customer then comes and sits on the chair to get their hair done. Then they leave. So what's got to happen? You've got to clean that chair before the next person comes in. So the, I can see the hairdressers, for, and there's no, there's no guidance for hairdressers at the moment, but I can foresee hairdressers having to actually have longer appointment times so as they can actually finish the hair, and then when the customer leaves, clean the chair down or the dressing out unit or whatever the customer's ha touched. So what you're really trying to achieve, Lee, is whoever comes into your premises, we try and not let them touch as many surfaces as we possibly can. Easier said than done, I know, but nevertheless. A restaurant, that's going to be a hard one um, because um, you're, you are going to use um, crockery and cutlery and stuff like that. But when the, when the waitress comes to lift them, what protection have we got for the waitress? Difficult. It is difficult, and that's one that has has come in. Obviously, lots of hospitality businesses across the Precinct Gallery, lots of restaurants. Uh, should we be delivering food to the tables, or should they go off? If we've got, I suppose, in theory, Raymond, if we've got that two meter social distancing where possible, uh, could the food be delivered to an an empty table next to where the order has been placed, and then the customers themselves take the the plates or items off that tray? Well, that's possible, of course it is. Um, it's going to be very difficult because you, you, what you want to try and do is, is um, reduce the, the number of people moving around our premises. Um, the, the restaurant I looked at, um, they have a male and a female toilet. And one of the issues we were going to be having with that one, I'm sorry I'm going to keep going back to toilets, but I will come back to the, the wait room, uh, waitressing part. Um, so is that the people in the restaurant can see if the toilet's actually vacant. They're about to install, you know, like the, the planes to have a red light and a green light? Yeah. They're going to, going to make the toilets unisex now. So is that, um, and they're going to put a, you know, a lock on the outside of the door, an electronic lock. So it's when that door's actually unlocked, it means you'll see a green light. And just like being on a plane, that's what you watch for, oh, toilet's vacant, I'm good, you know? Um, okay, that's not to say that somebody else does at the same time, but it reduces people standing in a queue. They will, they will, it reduces that down. Now, as far as the, the plates are concerned, um, would, it, would it be simpler to have the waitress wearing disposable surgical type gloves, as, as an example? If you look on the television at the moment in Italy, um, they've got screens around each, each table. Um, some of them are actually um, outside in greenhouses, believe it or not. Um, so they've got wee greenhouses outside it and they've got the table set up in that. The, the, the restaurant I've looked at is a, is a big restaurant in the place and they've got loads of space, but they are not going to remove tables. What they're going to do is they're going to remain a two metre apart, the tables, um, but the rest of the tables will, will remain there so that it doesn't look empty. And it, it will remain there with flowers on it or something on it but they'll not be set up for food. Um, so that's going to work quite well. And they could actually do, we're, we're having a one-way door in and a one-way door out. We're using one of the fire exits as the exit. So that's going to work. Um, there's nothing wrong. The thing is, when you go out for a meal, the last thing you want to be doing is sitting there and then having to go in. That's just like a buffet. Um, what, what is the point? Um, and I think to try and get these meals working properly. And it, again, it depends on the size of the premises. I think you could then think about PP for your staff. Okay. I, you mentioned again, when you have that PP, if you're using disposable uh, disposable items, they should be kept in a in a bin for, for a certain length of time before putting it back outside. It should be in a bag, basically, yeah. And I, but for three days, 72 hours, because uh, that's the period where the virus should die off uh, on any surface, more or less, between three and five days. But the same 72 hours is a recommendation from government. Um, in a bin, sealed bag, any this bin liner, basically, and before they're actually put in the, the main bin outside. That kills off the, the virus. Well, that's a theory. And again, should... Is it, we, we, look at equipment, as you mentioned, Raymond, going back into workspaces. 
would you recommend that the bins are actually all those those foot pedal operated ones as opposed to being swing bins or, or even dare i say it open top bins that we the waste basket bins that we find in many uh, premises just now uh, your waste baskets in an office is fine Lee, but they should be emptied on a daily basis and they should be emptied into into the, the a bin outside basically the, the waste bin um so there's no reason why your re, your re, uh, office bin has to have a lid on it uh, other bins um and toilets and things like that should have um a pedal operated you, you don't want to the least things you can touch the better um and that's that's the kind of things you should be looking at is you know What's a bin going to cost you? It's very little, you know. It's it, it's not a lot of money, but you you don't want open bins and toilets. You you really want these um, clip tops. You can just touch with your with your, with your foot. Okay, we've had a, a question come in here. Lots of a uh, obviously child care facilities across Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, Amanda's been in touch. She said we 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 run a family crash uh, within a centre. We've heard that every time a child plays with a toy or soft item, uh, maybe even a book. In theory, that has to be taken away and washed before the next child is able to play with this. Is that true? Because obviously that's going to have some big ramifications on, uh, on, on again, the manual handling again for, for that situation. What would we do? Because it's very hard to get a child to, to understand social distancing and the steps we need to take here. That's, that's not going to happen. Um, I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, fallacies going around that you have to do these things. A, a kid got to pass a toy or a kid got to take a, a, a toy off another kid. Um, it, it's impossible to actually police that. What I would be suggesting though is that toys, for example, are cleaned at the end of each day um, and you know before the next day type thing. Um, and you do as much hygiene as possible. It, it's, you, it would be virtually in that situation impossible to police that. Absolutely impossible. Kids will they'll not understand any of that anyway. They're going to share toys. Um, it's it's going to happen. It's as simple as that. Um, social distancing in that situation is going to be very difficult. Yeah, keeping kids apart is is What they're suggesting is, whenever possible, is get them outside. You know, as much as much of the the, the period that you can spend, and that will depend on weather, obviously. But um, you do that as as much as possible. Um, Get them outside, and that applies to everything, really. To be to be honest, um, um, you, you really do need to clean them, um, but you'll not get clean them between kids using them. I can't see that happening. I'm being honest with you. Uh, let's have a look at the next one here. There's one came in uh, in question, and you touched briefly on it: communal spaces and communal areas. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, let's take our, our office at the Chamber as an example. Obviously, we have a, an office within a shared building. Uh, we know the steps that we have to take as, a, as an office, as, a, as an employer, to make our workspace safe. Who is actually responsible for the, the building as a whole for those shared areas? Would that, is that the landlord or would we have to take that upon ourselves to get that ready? There's a couple of issues to that. Um, you're in the Crichton, um, Crichton Trust buildings and the communal areas are cleaned by the trust. So it depends on the contract as well. Um, if the contract is there and the cleaners, um, the landlord's cleaners come in and do all the communal areas, that's sorted. Um, however, you using them, you have to get together with all the, the other uh, employers on your floor um, when you're using the kitchen, for example, that's not a big kitchen, um, and I would say one person in at a time. So that's just a matter of getting together and actually sorting out your breaks as well, um, or actually just physically looking there and, and seeing, right, there's something in the kitchen I can't go in there at the moment, because that kitchen's not big enough to actually allow two people in and, and, and keep the two metres um, social distancing. So the answer is, um, if the contract is such that the landlord does the cleaning, then that's it sorted. If there is no contract or the landlord doesn't do the cleaning, then that's, that's down to the individual employers getting together. That's a bit like the fire risk assessment, if you like. You wouldn't do a fire risk assessment for each individual office. What you would do is you do a fire risk assessment for the floor or for the building. So all the employers would get together and basically have a communal one. And likewise, you have to actually um, 
work with each other and say, right, um, you get, you can do the cleaning and one views or two views or whatever, um, and work out some kind of wee rota system. But um, it's not necessarily the landlord's responsibility. It would be down to contracts All right. um, when it comes to things like that. Crime's much easier because I, I think they look after all the communal areas anyway. Okay, the next one we've got is a look for advice on outdoor activity equipment, a, such as paddles, blinds, aids, wetsuits, a, boats and climbing gear. Is there a specific time frame after which each can be used? So I suppose if you're, if you're out doing, a, doing an activity, you've got this equipment on, you're taking it off, you're, you're cleaning it, you're disinfecting it, how long would you recommend leaving before that goes on to the next person? Well, like I said earlier, it depends on the, on the, the, the actual liquid or, or the, the material, you, well, what you're allowed to clean it with it is, is the first thing, um, with it actually affecting the, the material itself. If you're using a proper bleach or chlorine-based type of um, cleaning agent, then that should basically kill anything within 30 seconds. So once it's cleaned and allowed to dry, um, what, why wouldn't you be able to use it? Because you've actually killed it. Now, the problem is there are, there are some people, for example, um, selling uh, alcohol-free hand sanitizers, right? Now, the government is basically saying it should be a minimum 60% alcohol-based to kill off this virus. So what on earth is anybody buying alcohol-free sanit? Now, they, they will be effective, but much less effective than the alcohol. The one we sell, for example, is 80%. We went above it because we know that's going to be a better, a better hand sanitizer. It's exactly what the hospital's using. Um, so basically, it depends on what you can clean it with and how well you've cleaned it. But wetsuits and buoyancy aids and things like that, I would, I would be suggesting you would have to find out, first of all, from the manufacturer, what can we clean this with to kill off the virus? Now, I'm not a professional in, in cleaning items such as that, and it would really depend on, on the item itself. Can it be cleaned with a, with a, and we're not talking about pure bleach, by the way, it's bleach based. So basically, something that's going to kill COVID-19 uh, off is going to be a, be a bleach based, or one, there's lots of products on the market um, that um, Ecolab and people like that actually produce these virus um, antiviral um, disinfectants. These are all good products. Um, and the, 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 the stuff in the market, that, I mean, the, the antibacterial wipes we're using it, it was specifically for various flu type, um, RSA, and it's, um, uh, SARS and things like that. Um, so basically, um, it's that kind of product you need to, you need to investigate that a wee bit further. Um, as I said, I wouldn't have the answers to all these, all these questions, but you need to investigate it, and if it kills off the virus quickly, then why would you not be able to use it straight away? Okay, that's grand. So there, check the manufacturer's instructions, have a look at that, and then follow up. Exactly, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Exactly. Good question, sir. Okay, the next one, uh, and this is, this is something that we've seen lots of places abroad put this in place already. Uh, Raymond, should we be checking uh, staff and customer temperatures before allowing people into premises? Well, oh, it's, it's another control measure. We actually have, we bought a non-contact temperature um, um, instrument, basically. And we have it sitting uh, for our own, as long as there's only three staff in at the moment. But we actually check um, their temperatures and we record that. So it's when the staff come in in the morning, we know they've not got a temperature. Now, there's no, there, you would not find that legally a legal requirement anywhere. But... Um, that's down to the employer. If they think that's a control measure, personally, for me, I think it's a good control measure. It's a method. Um, we were in premises, good fire extinguishers, or it's a big, big premises, a big logistics company. And when you walk into reception, they've got a thermal imaging camera. So you actually stand there, and it, it actually is checking your whole body for um, for temperature. So. They, they, I mean, that's, that, that system that they put in was about four and a half grand. Um, no need to do as far as that. We bought a, a, a non-contact thermometer for, I think we paid about 50 pounds for it. 
Um, so we've got that sitting just as you come in, only for the staff. And we've also got, you know, one of the wee um, things that goes in your finger for checking oxygen. Um, we've, we've actually got that. So we're actually, we're checking, we're checking the oxygen levels in somebody, in our staff, and the temperature on a daily basis and recording that. But that's just an, an additional control measure, and that's in our COVID-19 risk assessment. Would I advise it? Yes. Uh, and just one final one. I know we're I know we're pushing against time, and uh, if anyone does have any questions that we haven't had the chance to ask uh, Raymond here, you can get in touch with him direct. It's Raymond at Boyd-Group.uk, or you can check out the website Boyd-Group.uk. Uh, all the details uh, I'll put on the email that we'll send right after the presentation with this as well. Uh, but again, Raymond, it's something you mentioned earlier: communication, communication, and communication. How important is it that we communicate with? our customers uh, about the steps we are taking, uh, not only our staff. You're absolutely right. Um, and we have to we have to communicate with the customers. Um, here Vesta was talking to yesterday, she's basically contacted, this is a, a, in preparation, um, and basically said, look, can you bring your own gloves and your own face mask because we won't supply them? And um, so they're communicating with it. Now, um, I know this is going to be in reverse, but that is pro provided by the government. And they are suggesting it's a, it's a, a staying COVID-19 secure in 2020, it's called. And we should actually have that posted on our doors um, when people actually enter the building. And basically what you're telling people, and this is for your customers, clients, delivery drivers, we have carried out a COVID-19 risk assessment. We are cleaning, hand washing and hygiene procedures in line with guidance tick. We have taken all reasonable steps to help people work from home tick. We have taken all reasonable steps to maintain a two metre distance in the workplace. And the tick and the last tick, where people cannot be two metres apart, we have done everything practical to manage transmission risk. And you put the employer's name, the date in that, and who to contact. So that there is what the government's suggesting that we post, which you can download from the internet from the government website. Um, and that should be displayed at every workplace so that people coming into the premises feel or should feel safe that they've done everything in place. Just in a, a re addition to, to the information, if anybody wants, and this is, this is open to anybody, uh, and we we'll need to monitor it obviously because it can't be advanced on the phone in two minutes, but um, I've basically said to anybody, and it's not just um, chamber members, if anybody wants to talk to me on the phone, there is no charge for that. It's the phone 01387 251170 and ask for me, then I'm happy to to, to help anybody um, with this with us at the moment. And as I said, I've offered this free of charge to anybody. And as long as I don't need to go and see it or actually do any physical work, there is absolutely no charge for that. Raymond, thank you so, so much for taking the time this morning to, to guide us through this. Uh, if you have been on this uh, webinar, we are going to send out a copy of Raymond's presentation. We're going to put the contact details on there as well. So if you do have any questions that you want to follow up to, you can do that. Uh, Raymond, thank you so, so much for taking the time. Uh, one final word from yourself. Uh, what is going to be the most important thing uh, coming out of this? The one thing that we need to remember more than anything else the one thing, there's actually two things, and, and it's, it's quite simple. It's a two metre social distancing. Stay away from people and wash your hands or sanitise your hands, and that will keep us safe and alive, hopefully. And in the recent gallery, we, we have been very lucky, very, very lucky compared to other parts of the country. But as long as we can maintain the two metre social distancing, very important, and the hygiene, we will hopefully be safe and be safe out there, folks. Thank you very much, Raymond Boyd, MD of the Boyd Group. As he says, all the details on service.